Let's Go Green, sponsored by Airgrid, managing and operating Ireland's electricity grid for a cleaner energy future. Check out airgrid.ie for more. Hello, and you are very welcome to this week's episode of Let's Go Green here on Midlands 103. I'm your host, Ashling O'Rourke, and I hope you are safe and well as you tune in this week. We have a packed show for you this week. You might remember a little while ago, we spoke to a young man who was very passionate about the environment in Westmead. Well, Ryan Dolan will be back on with us a little bit later on to tell us what brought him to the European Parliament. And we'll also be checking in on fast fashion and what is happening in France and the French Parliament around fast fashion, but also what's happening here and a new campaign aimed at encouraging us to be more educated about where our clothing comes from. But first things first, we're going to talk all things waste. And we're joined now by Kevin Swift. And Kevin is from the Regional Waste Management Planning Offices. Kevin, you are so welcome to Let's Go Green. Thank you. Now, Kevin, in recent weeks, all local authorities across the country have agreed a new plan, a new strategy in how they're going to manage waste right around the country in the hopes of getting us as a nation to produce less waste. Is that right? Yeah, that's about the size of it, Ashling. Um, the local government sector, uh, that is all county councils and city councils together, have for the first time collectively made one plan. And the plan is called, as you say, the National Waste Management Plan for a Circular Economy. The local government sector is responsible in law for making plans for the management of waste, even though on a practical level in our day-to-day lives, we see that the waste industry has become privatised in terms of waste collection or in terms of waste processing or waste disposal, even for that matter. Local authorities have still a very big role in terms of regulating the sector, in terms of enforcing the rules around it, Mm -hmm. and also in terms of increasing awareness and providing education around uh, waste-related issues. So it's in that context that the sector brings forward this plan uh, and it sets out really a framework for the next six years. And what is interesting about this is that the chief executive officers of each of the local authorities, so that would be Lee Shoffley, Westmeath and all the rest, they've sat down as a team and they've agreed this. So up until now, the strategies, the rules in each county may have been different, but now there's a national strategy going to come into force. Yeah, there has been an evolution in that whole waste planning process over the last three decades, really, since we started in law to plan for waste. And that started with the Waste Management Act way back in 1996. So councils around that time would have had singular plans for a county. Then we evolved and we produced regional plans. Um, I I look after the kind of Dulster region, for example. Uh, You guys are in the Eastern and Midlands region. And now, laterally, we've adopted one national waste management plan for a circular economy. So, yes, I mean, there is a collective agreement and there is now consistency in one plan. And that's important because as a sector, we speak to key stakeholders, key partners. And it's important as a sector that we're able to speak with one voice. And now we can. So one plan, one voice, one sector. You now have a, a unity of messaging. So it doesn't matter what part of the country you're living in, you're going to be, the, the rules are going to be the same. So how is this going to affect us as residents of all of these counties? You know, will we be seeing changes in how our waste is collected or what we're being encouraged to do? Well, the big overarching ambition for this plan is what we call 0% total waste growth over the lifetime of the plan. Now, what that means in practical terms is that we want to put a lid on the amount of waste that each and every one of us presents each year or produces each year. And we can do that by a number of ways. We can just prevent waste. We can, you know, 
uh, start to look at how we consume stuff, uh, reduce the amount of stuff that we consume. Uh, but inevitably, we're going to consume stuff. And, you know, this plan is, talks a little bit about circularity and maybe keeping materials in use for longer. So the plan is very much about, you know, continuing that evolution of reduce, reuse, recycle, but also adding another R to the equation, which is refuse. So at the front end, maybe you need to think twice uh, about the things that you acquire. Maybe you need to think twice about what you want versus what you need. And you mentioned uh, textiles at the at the beginning of the the piece there, and that's that's an interesting case in point, whereby uh, we we consume a lot of textiles, mm -hmm. and a lot of textiles end up as waste, and that's that's simply not a sustainable model, uh, not just in Ireland but uh, globally as well. I'm thinking of you know the grocery shop, and like one of my pet hates, and I talk about it a lot. On, on the show is like every time I go to the supermarket and I think we all have to go and buy food but every time I go to the supermarket and it doesn't really matter what supermarket I go to because to be honest with you I'm a bit of an agnostic shopper I go to the one that's handy to me depending on the week that's in it um, I seem to have like my kitchen counter as I unpack everything just mountains of bits of plastic bits of like things and I'm going looking at them going well, which bin does it go into because I'm not too sure about that like now that you have a national strategy and now that we have, as you say, the entire sector speaking with one voice, does that give you more weight to then go to the likes of the supermarket sector and say, look, lads, you need to start stocking things without plastic wrapping. You need to start making this easier for people on a daily basis. Yeah, and look, <clears throat> you're not unusual. Uh you know, as part of our consultation process in the preparation of this plan, one of the real frustrating issues that comes through all of the time from consumers is packaging. Now, having said that, we're not bad at handling the packaging that we produce, but we produce too much of it. So there's a number of things in our plan that, that aim to get at that. I mean, what we want to try and do is talk to producers of packaging to make sure that whatever packaging they're placing on the market is not composite, for example, that it's not a combination of plastics and paper and cardboard so that it's easy or more easy to recycle. And if it's easier to recycle, then it has a chance of being circular in the sense that we can make something else out of it. Um, but in addition to that, you know, there are incentives uh, for producers as well in terms of through the repack scheme, which is the scheme for um, producer compliance, uh, there are added incentives for uh, producers that put material onto the market that is more recyclable. So we're getting a push from from, from that end, um, mm -hmm. but we're also trying to get the pull from the other end of saying to people, well, you know, maybe you can buy loose veg, uh, maybe you can buy, uh, well, maybe now you can go to. The That's, refill section in the store, you know. Yeah, and like that, like, and I'm only the veg is what I was thinking of there as well. Like, like I know I can go to my local vegetable shop, you know, if they're open or if I have the budget because it tends to be slightly more expensive, um, and get the loose. Like I'm single, if I get three or four carrots in a week, that's plenty for me. But mm. you know. If I go to a bigger supermarket, I have to buy a pack of 20 that mm. are gone off before I get to the end of the packet, even mm. though I love carrots, mm. and I'm just using carrots as an yeah. example. Yeah. Like. Could we not see a national movement to go to these big retailers and say, you've got to do better? Yeah, I think where the pressure will come, and it's a joint thing, you know, we can make rules and uh, we can try and encourage people to comply with those rules and we have enforcement powers as well. But as I said earlier on, there's a push and a pull. And I think, you know, producers will move with consumer sentiment. So if you and I and consumers continue to say, look, you know, we, we don't like this amount of packaging. We don't like the way you're presenting uh, your goods. Uh, then you'll see producers starting to fall into line with that. And, you know, I know you said earlier on, you, you're not a particularly loyal shopper, but uh, if you go into certain chains, you will start to see uh, more refill options becoming available and alternative ways of, of, of procuring the things that you need to reduce mm -hmm. the amount of a packaging that's associated with them. Uh, but inevitably, we're going to have packaging. 
and inevitably, uh, you know, the thing is that we capture that packaging and we capture it in a way that it has the best chance of being circular, being made into something else. And that comes back to the basics, really. You know, are we segregating properly? Are we segregating in a way that gives a, a good circular future to these items? And, you know, we our mantra in terms of the recycling bin, for example, is clean, dry, loose. If you're putting your materials into your recycling bin, clean, dry, and loose, then they have a potential circular future. If you're not putting them in in that way, then they inevitably end up in the landfill or the recovery uh, waste stream particularly, and that's not good. We are, like, let's be honest about it, behind the curve when it comes to recycling and waste. When we look at our, our European partners, but I'm wondering, did that give you an advantage when you were putting this plan and this strategy ahead in that because this has been done at a larger scale across Europe and approached in different ways in different European countries, can you then really take the best from what the likes of France and Germany and Spain and Portugal have already been doing? Well, certainly, you know, some countries are are, are better uh, than we are. We have a, quite a unique market in Ireland in the sense that in European countries, um, waste service continues to be delivered through the municipalities or through the local authorities. Whereas in Ireland, we've, we, we've allowed or uh, the situation has developed whereby the private sector provide the collection and, you know, we make the rules and we, we try and square that circle as we go along. But certainly there's loads of examples out there of how to do things better. We're doing things fairly well. Um, so householders are doing well in terms of the segregation of waste. Uh, in the recent past, over the last number of months, government has just introduced regulations that will entitle every household in the country, if they're on a collection route, to avail of a brown or food waste bin. So that if you are producing food or garden waste, that you have an option of segregating that properly. So that reduces the risk of that going into a recycling bin and causing contamination. It also reduces the amount of residual waste that's in the general waste bin, mm. which ultimately has to either go to landfill or go to recovery or, as people like to say, incineration, or it goes uh, by way of export to the continent for incineration. And we continue to export from Ireland over 300,000 tonnes annually of waste to the continent because we don't have sufficient infrastructure on the island to deal with it. So we have a choice, a, a, quite a stark choice there. Either A, we build more infrastructure to uh, incinerate a lot of this material, or B, we try and reduce the amount of material that that, that has to be subjected to that type of treatment. Um, you know, this, the thing that we're in control of is trying to reduce it. Uh, and that's what this plan is, is very much about. And you say we're doing quite well. Um, obviously, you know, improvement is always needed. But hmm. what kind of reaction have you been getting? I know this plan was re released in the in recent weeks. So I'm curious as to how members of the public have responded to you, even when, when you're talking about it. You know, um, are you getting the buy in that you would hope for? Well, look, this is a high level strategic framework document that sets the kind of scope for the next six years. How do people relate to this on a practical level? Well, you know, at the front end, people get their waste services provided by collectors. Um, you know, the interface between, you know, planning and the practicality of managing waste really happens at the doorstep. Um, so when people interact with us, uh, it's very much around, well, you know, I can't get a service or I can get a service, but it's not as fulsome as I would like. Uh, where's my nearest civic community site? Can I avail of the full range of services there? What do I do if I have hazardous waste in my home? Uh, for example, like paint or light bulbs or aerosols or stuff like that. And, you know, what we've done over the last plan period, if you like, is to create one national platform for all things waste, and that's entitled mywaste.ie. And during the consultation process for this plan, uh, we facilitated you know, feedback from, from the public 
uh, to the to the draft plan. And I'm happy to say that we got over 1,500 um, submissions from directly from the public uh, through our uh, online platform with various views, uh, everything from waste presentation to waste disposal and everything in between. So people are exercised about these things because inevitably, I think you said it yourself earlier on, you know, waste is an everyday thing. Um, it's something that we're confronted with every day in our homes, in our workplaces, and elsewhere. Um, so it, it it is ubiquitous and, and there's no getting away from it, but uh, we need to try to continue to manage it better. And uh, we will have seen the rollout of the uh, the deposit return, return scheme nationally in, in recent weeks. And uh, though there are some inevitable teething problems around that, um, it's seen as a key uh, intervention to try and get us to where we need to be particularly in relation to the level of plastics recycling. So we're, we're a little bit behind the curve on that one. Um, and, and that method has been proven in, in other jurisdictions to, to close that gap. So that's why we're, that's why we're on that one. And uh, uh, I know it's made the airwaves a little bit in recent days, but I, I'm sure it'll, um, it'll bed down in the coming months and, and, and deliver in the way that it has done in other countries. Well, look, any any new system takes time for us all to to get used to using it, yeah. to, to figure out even any technical problems with it like yeah. that. That all will take time. And, and you know, I remember um, a very wise man by the name of Dr. Kidney, who was my family GP as a child, saying to me at one point that it takes eight weeks to form a habit, but two weeks yeah. to fall out of it. So yeah. um, I'm sure it'll take us time, but hopefully we will adopt yeah. and get yeah. more used to all of these new measures. So that website, mywaste.ie, if people have any questions or want yeah. to find out more about that plan. Well, Kevin Swift of the Re- the Regional Waste Management Planning Offices, thank you very much for joining us on Let's Go Green. Thank you so much, Ashley. We'll be back after the break. Let's Go Green, sponsored by Airgrid, managing and operating Ireland's electricity grid for a cleaner energy future. Check out airgrid.ie for more. You're listening to Let's Go Green here on Midlands 103. I hope you're enjoying our show so far this week. Well, as I mentioned at the top of the um, this week's episode of Let's Go Green, we're turning now to the fashion industry and fast fashion in particular. And joining us now from Voice Ireland is Solène Shearer. And Solène has been working on a brand new campaign Threads for Transparency. So, Len, you're very welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so, so, Len, first things first, um, this came to my attention um, through Voice Ireland, who we frequently have on the show, uh, different spokespeople for your organisation. But there has been a bit of a development in France and the French Parliament in recent weeks. So, Take us through what exactly they've decided to do across the water. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, so basically what happened is two weeks ago, there's been two different proposals at the French Parliament that is specifically targeting ultra fast fashion. When I'm saying ultra, it means that it's mostly the online platforms. So, you know, all of these Shein, Temu, all of these that don't have physical shops. So that's what we call ultra fast fashion. And these uh, laws are basically targeting these um, platforms um, for their unfair competition to other types of shops, basically. Um, So the idea between those two uh, texts is to have a penalty of up to 10 euros per item within the 50% of the selling price, obviously. Um, So that would be per item bought on the web website uh, paid by the consumer. So that is basically to kind of counteract these prices that are so, so low. You can see t-shirts of two euros, uh, jackets for less than 10. That is completely uh, crazy in a way. And also because that doesn't reflect at all um, what it takes uh, and the resources that go into producing these can, these uh, products. So there's this one thing about putting the penalty back on it, and that would be part of the EPR because France is one of the only country having a an extended producer responsibility on 
textiles and fashion. Um, and the second important thing as well is that they want to tackle the advertisement. So they the those big brands and those big platforms couldn't be uh, they would have there would be, be a ban basically on advertisement and also paid partnerships with influencers online. So a lot more regulations around that. And that's really important because at the moment it's kind of wild to see like mm. people advertising for Sheen and holes every week, letting people like think that it's normal to buy like that many clothes all the time and reinforcing the idea of disposable clothes, obviously. And like in a, many ways, this shouldn't come as a surprise because France has had a a different approach to retail for generations. France has very stringent rules around the, the, the kind of outlets that can open up, but, you know, the kind of stores. It's not as, um, I suppose, free in a way as we would have it here in Ireland. But that has resulted in, you know, the boulangerie and the gelato shops and all the mm. small little boutiques that in many ways we've lost here in Ireland. There's a system in France where those individual boutiques have been protected. So the fact that France is the first country in Europe to do something like this with a view to protect the local retailers um, doesn't mm. really come as much as a surprise. But what's the reaction to this been? Well, so far, um, mostly positive, I'd say, like, because what's interesting with this uh, proposal is that it hasn't been proposed by Greens or, you know, um, specifically, it's been proposed by right wing um, MPs. So that's really interesting because their approach to it is um, even if for some of us, it would be enough just to look at the environmental and social impact of it. Uh, for them, there's also the idea of obviously the also the health conditions, because loads of uh, those products don't uh, meet the requirements that we have in Europe and in France about uh, the chemicals that are used and everything. And their second and most important um, argument is also the yeah, countering this this unfair competition to French and European manufacturers that are trying to do better, that are trying to propose uh, products that are better designed, better sourced, and all of this. So there, that that's a really interesting point. Um, and so it, we are pretty hopeful for this law, I guess. Um, although the the organizations that did push for that through their Stop Fast Fashion campaign led by Friends of the Earth France, um, they would ideally like the law to be more extensive than just online platforms to also comprise uh, physical shops of fast fashion brands such as Zara or H&M to, again, reinforce those smaller brands that are trying mm. to propose something that's of better value, more durability and everything. So then that brings us on to the whole conversation around fast fashion and even the conditions of the workers who make the fast fashion clothing like that is of of, of huge concern around the world. Um, So tell me then about the Threads for Transparency uh, campaign that you and Voice Ireland and you and Voice Ireland are launching and are involved in. Yeah, so uh, this campaign was launched last October. And um, although I would love also to campaign for what France is doing at the moment, we are going backwards and a little bit uh, uh, on the on the other side here, which is the, the textile waste. And what do we do with that? Um, because that's also where you kind of start from. Um, so the, the thing that we kind of started from is that in Ireland, there's no definition of what is textile waste. So that was really surprising to us. And so we started to dig a little bit more about what this did that this that mean what that meant, sorry. Um and so basically what that implies is that everything that we discard, so the hundred and seventy thousand tons of textile that we discard every year, which is a huge amount, it's equ equivalent to 35 kilos per person. Um, so what does happen to it? And the the thing is that 65% of it just goes to landfill directly, just through the brown bin, uh, the, the black bin. And so um, that shows that there's no proper waste stream for that. Mm -hmm. And the, second, the rest of it, the 35% remaining, are collected, separately collected, either by charity shops or by commercial collectors. So the commercial collectors are the ones that own those bring bags that you can find kind of around the country. 
Um, and even though the charity shops do emphasize on reuse and they do a brilliant job, those commercial collectors are not uh, doing that. That Their main objective is not to reuse, it's just to export for profit. And that's where lies the problem, is that if you don't have a definition of these textiles as waste, then the commercial collectors can just export it out of Ireland and not deal with it. So it's basically exporting our waste away mm-hmm. without having to deal with it. And like the problem there, and even in the charity sector, because I know I've spoken to people who work in the area and like charity shops, you know, some of them are lucky enough to have nearly, they, they get so many donations that they mm-hmm. don't really know what to do with. And they have to then engage commercial collectors because they sometimes have more than they can cope with. But yet, even though they try to find someone who they think is doing things right, they don't really know because there's no real system in place. And like, I think, you know, we've all seen those collection banks around the country and, you know, you might have clothing that you feel is not good enough for a charity shop or or things that maybe a charity shop won't take. And then you need to dispose of it because it's beyond its use. But there's a challenge there about what the right thing is. So what would you like to see happen? Like a definition of waste is one thing, but what would that mean then in practical terms? So the idea through with that is that those commercial collectors would then be regulated as waste managers. Um, and so they would have to report on what happens to clothes. Our goal is really to have this transparency and traceability in the sector um, so that we don't like get completely greenwashed in the way of them just telling us, oh, it's going to be repurposed. But how, where, when, <laughs> uh, you know, when you look at the numbers, there's only 1% of recycling capacity in the world globally. So uh, when they're telling you it's going to be recycled 100%, that's just impossible because we just don't have the capacity neither in Europe, neither outside of it. So for us, the idea is just to have this traceability so that when we do have an EPR in place, in the future, which should be happening in the coming years, um, we will be able to have this fee following the cloth and properly um, funding the people who deal with this waste, which at the moment is for a lot of parts in the global south. Um, yeah. And just for listeners' benefit, what is the EPR again? Yeah, so the EPR is an extended producer responsibility. So that means that whenever a producer is putting a product on the market, they need to pay a small fee per item um, that will be destined to fund the um, recycling or waste management. Um, So hopefully we'll also want to extend it to reuse uh, activities so that the charity shops could benefit from it because um, that would be a huge help for the sector to develop and really have a lot more. Um, But also uh, I think one idea is from the start kind of redesign what we what we wear because at the moment I think the problem is volumes whatever we do it's still going to go back to the problems of how how many we have to deal with mm. and we see these like essentially close mountains where they end up maybe washing up on the shores on a beach somewhere in like you say in, in the global south and really do we know how that even happens at the moment because there's so little transparency in the sector? Yeah, well, the idea is that basically when it leaves Ireland, for example, it'll go to a wholesaler in Europe. So there are huge uh, facilities in Germany or uh, Belgium. And so they receive clothes from all over Europe and they kind of sort through and just get the highest quality for the vintage international uh, market. So that would be about maybe 10% max (laughs) of what they receive and the rest they export it again outside of the EU. Um, and that is a loophole in the in the legislation here because again that most of it can be considered waste, but because there's mm-hmm. no regulations and no definition, 
well, they can just export whatever they want. Um, and so loads of it go in Africa, East Asia, and even in South, Af- South America now. And uh, it's supposed to be repurposed. But those secondhand markets in Africa, for example, uh, we have proof from the Or Foundation that works in Ghana, for example, that the bales that they receive have roughly 18% of clothes that are reusable right away. And the rest is needs either work from the workers there or are just being discarded, you know, in open air landfills. And that's where it starts. It's just clogging rivers. And that's just really horrible fate for it. And it's about 50 percent of it. So um, that's all because there's no regulations from the start of saying that's waste. So the key is then to include a definition of textile waste absolutely bring bring that in under the national waste management plan here in ireland um which we were speaking about um at the top of the hour there on the show as well this evening so um how do listeners find out more about the threads for transparency campaign but they can go on voiceireland.org. So that's our website. And there's a dedicated page for the Threads of Transparency campaign. You've got a video. You've got a the whole position paper that we're also um, working with decision makers to try to get that through. Um, and yeah, just uh, you can also follow us on social media because we are talking about this and it's going to there's going to be more content over the coming months because uh, we are also working on developing a specific website for textiles, for fashion um, to help people navigate the fashion world today because it can be hard even mm-hmm. if we have good intentions to know exactly what to look for, where, how and uh, have the good information get got to us. Well, perhaps when you have that information site um, launched, you'll come back on Let's Go Green to discuss it with us. I'd be happy to. (laughs) Well, Solène Shearer, thank you so much for joining us on this week's episode of Let's Go Green to talk about the Voice Ireland Threads of Transparency campaign. And, And look, we are in an election year. So if this is something that you care about, you know, it's time when you when people are knocking on your front doors and canvassing and looking for your votes. Perhaps this is a topic that you can bring up with them. Selene, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you. We'll be back after the break. Let's Go Green, sponsored by Airgrid, managing and operating Ireland's electricity grid for a cleaner energy future. Check out airgrid.ie for more. You're listening to Let's Go Green here on Midlands 103. Now, first things first, I must correct the record. Our next guest is not a Westmeath man, but in fact, Russ Common man who goes to school in Westmeath. So my apologies to Russ Common listeners. Ryan Dolan, you are so welcome back to the show. You have been a very busy young man since we last spoke. Yeah, thanks for having me back on. Um, so I suppose things have picked up since we last spoke back there last year. Um, I've been working a lot on mental health projects as well as um, keeping going with the sustainability, the Fridays for Future, um, lots going on there. I have um, became a national organiser and I've, I have a lot of influence on the international strikes now this year. Um, so it's great to see that um, and it's great to see things like the deposit return scheme come into place, which has been talked about on your programme before. Um, and I actually used it for the first time today. And I'm thankful to say that it did work for me. Not like people were saying on social media that it isn't working. It is working. So it was great to see. And look, with the rollout of any new technology, um, there will be glitches. There will be teething problems. And we just all have to get into the habit of it. I have to say, I found myself um, bidding, uh, not bidding, putting them into the recycling bin, but bottles that I'd paid the deposit on just out of pure habit, you know? So I just have to set the new habit. And I think we all have to get around to that. But you were abroad, you you were speaking to um, some high level people and influencers. Uh, Tell our listeners about that. Yeah, so um, my school back in November uh, nominated me for the Road for Youth Leadership Development Competition. Um, at the time, I didn't know much about it. Um, I kind of knew that Rotary, what Rotary were. I knew that they'd run the Remembrance Tree and that loan, that kind of stuff. Um, but 
I got nominated for the first interview in the school. Ten of us um, got put forward. Um, I ended up being the winner from the school and I went on to the Athlone final. So I, I was the winner from that. And then I went on to my zone final. So that was, I was the North Leinster zone. Um, so I also won that um, zone final. And from there, I was awarded with the National Rotary um, Youth Leadership Development Award. So... Um, I hadn't done much looking into it because I'm in fifth year now, very busy. Oh, <laughs> and yes. not, like last, not like last year. <laughs> um, so anyway, I got word then of what the prize was. And I was a bit surprised because it ended up being a five-day um, trip to Stormont, Dáil Éireann and to um, the European Parliament in Strasbourg. So it was an absolutely amazing experience to get that award and to be able to go over there. And like I met with people like Emma Little Pengelly up at DUP, first, uh, Deputy First Minister up in the north. And that was amazing to get that experience. And then down we came down to the south then to Dáil Éireann and I met with um, Minister Martin, uh, Michal Martin, and um, other people like Minister Chambers. We met with um, Alan Farrell, TD for Fianna Fáil Gael, and Mairead Farrell, TD for Sinn Féin. So it was great to get to see kind of cross board, cross party um, opinions, and they were all there together. So it was nice to see them kind of all answering the same questions in their own different ways. But um, there was a lot of overlap. So it was good to see that, although we do have an opposition in our government, they're not opposing everything. <laughs> um, so it's good to see that. Um, and it was just an amazing experience in Dublin because I had never been in Dáil Éireann before, mm -hmm. uh, which was a surprise to some of my friends that I know in the youth activism sector and things. Um, and then the highlight of the trip had to be um, we flew over to Frankfurt and transferred down to Strasbourg for a day in the European Parliament. So um, the Parliament actually was sitting in Brussels at the time. They're in their committee phase. Um, but we got to sit in the chamber in Strasbourg, the European Parliament plenary chamber. And then there was there was uh, MEPs tuning in. They were just online because um, they were in Brussels, obviously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it was a, just the most amazing experience to get to sit in that chamber. And we actually got to debate like the MEPs. So the topic we were debating was the EU, um, EU's commitment to air emissions. So that was a really kind of cool topic and one that I hadn't thought about much. So, so for would, our listeners benefit now, what exactly are air emissions? Um, so I think the big thing that the listeners would know air emissions as is them planes to fly over your house every so often. Um, there's a lot of controversy at the moment with um, Ryanair. Um, it's up on social media with Michael O'Leary and the Green Party. There's a, there's kind of a bit of a social media war going on at the moment about their um, emissions. Um, so we kind of, the debate, I suppose... There, there was a, a policy analyst there that gave us kind of context on what um, the whole thing was. And then we got to debate it. So although we didn't have long to prepare, the debate was because we were only given the topic on the morning. So okay. um, they, that's the way they do it. They don't give you the topic in advance. So we got the topic. Um, we put together our arguments. So... It was it was a bit all over the place, but it was good crack, um, and we got to we got to debate it basically, and we got to use all the um, fancy gadgets in the EU Parliament for voting and everything. So it was very cool. And <laughs> like this is like that's an opportunity that most young people don't get. Like let's be honest yeah. about it. Like most adults have never actually sat in the European Parliament chamber. You know that's that's a big deal. Yeah. How, like looking back on it now, has it changed anything for you or made you think a little bit differently? Um, well, there's actually, the, the, the event was live streamed and um, my mother and father both uh, find it very funny because I asked a question to um, the vice president of the European Parliament as to how he would say for young people that are involved in politics, um, ways that they can get to kind of that level or become a local politician in their country. And then once he had given his um, 
his kind of answer, I went and said, oh yeah, I'd actually be interested in working in this parliament someday. So I kind of threw it out that I wanted a job. Um, so if I'm completely honest with you, I never kind of considered European politics. Um, I'm, I'm kind of a home bird kind of think if I am going to go into politics, it'll be true law in this country. Um, but I'm kind of thinking now maybe EU law or um, law with human rights to sit in kind of the European Court of Human Rights, that kind of stuff might be interesting. And like there's very interesting cases in the um, European Court of Human Rights, like with um, big shipping companies and oil and that kind of stuff. Like that's the big case that's going on at the moment. There's a shipping company um, that released oil that they weren't supposed to release and it affected fishing villages Um up in the Scandinavian countries. And that's a case that's being brought to the European Court of Human Rights at the moment. So it's really interesting reading into things. So it definitely has changed my perspective on the future. I can't say what way yet, but I'm sure if I come back on in another year, I'll know. <laughs> well, you are absolutely a very impressive young man. We we must give a shout out to, to your school. So what school do you go to and do you have any teachers you want to mention in particular? Um, well, I go to Athlone Community College and I suppose I have to give a big shout out to um, my CSP and geography, CSP for junior cert and my current geography teacher, Miss um, Rebecca Dobson, and then my deputy principal and principal, Mrs. Um, Eileen Donahue and Miss Grania Macken. They were the most supportive people the whole way through the process. And even like I have to shout out the Rotary Club in Athlone, Ethel Gavin. Um, was so amazing to me and she gave me all the information I needed and I'm so thankful to Rotary um, for the opportunity. Well, Ryan Dolan, it's always a pleasure to have you on the show. Um, I won't be in the slightest bit surprised in a couple of years' time when I see your face in an election poster. Um, but uh, <laughs> don't forget us when you go and fight those uh, court cases in the European Court of Human Rights. You, you, you may still remember us here on Let's Go Green. Ashling, we can't put up posters anymore. We have to be environmentally friendly. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Well, that's a debate for another day. We did have a we did have a company on a couple of weeks back that you might want to investigate that allows you rent and then recycle your election posters. But uh, but perhaps Ryan, you and I can have that chat off air. Listen, thank you so much for joining us here on Let's Go Green once again. Thanks, Ashling. We'll be back after the break. Let's Go Green, sponsored by Airgrid, managing and operating Ireland's electricity grid for a cleaner energy future. Check out airgrid.ie for more. You're listening to Let's Go Green here on Midlands 103. A big thank you to all the contributors to this week's episode of the show. I hope you found the discussion around the country's new waste management plan for a circular economy. Man, it's a long-winded title, isn't it? But I hope you found the uh, the conversation useful and we will invite um, the, the representatives back on to speak about their My Waste website at some point where you can go and find out more information about it because I think one of the big things around waste is that many of us are trying to do our bit. In fact, I think the majority of us are trying to do our bit, but sometimes it can be really hard to know where which bins things should go in. Um, and then at the other end of it, we do have to start making more informed choices when we are out and about shopping and deciding what we actually need to bring home with us. And I know that some grocery stores have those bins where you can take apart the packaging after you know, you've gotten as far as the checkout. But like realistically, should we really need to do even that? Should the retailers not make it easier for us? I think so. But perhaps you have a different opinion and I would love to hear from you. So if you'd like to get involved in Let's Go Green, please do get in contact with me. Hop over to midlands103.com. Click on the on air team. Once you scroll down there, you'll see uh, my face, uh, my name, Ashling O'Rourke. And if you click on that button there, you can send me an email directly from that page. And I really enjoy hearing from each and every one of you. And one person who did just that was our last guest, the young Ryan Dolan, who is, of course, a fifth year student in Athlone Community College. And wow, he's an impressive young man. And I sincerely expect to see him on um, 
going for a political office at some level, at some point in the not too distant future, I imagine. he He's a very impressive young man and fair play to him and um, all those who have supported him and getting that opportunity to debate with MEPs from Strasbourg really is um, a once in a lifetime opportunity. So I hope it does inspire him in his future endeavours. Just a reminder that if you've missed any episodes of Let's Go Green here on Midlands 103, all episodes of the show are available on the midlands103.com podcast page. You can also find us on Spotify and indeed Apple Podcasts. Please do, if you're going on those apps, hit that follow button to make sure that each and every episode of the show is delivered straight to your phone. And if you are an Apple Podcast listener, please do go and give us a review because it all helps to spread the word about Let's Go Green here on Midlands 103 with myself, Ashling O'Rourke. Well, that's it for this week. We have another Monday night off because next week is Easter Bank Holiday Monday. Um, I know at a certain time of year we have Twixmas, which I find hard to say. Do we now have Twixter between Patrick's Day and Easter? I don't know. It's a terrible name, isn't it? Really bad idea. Forget I said anything. Listen, have a great Easter. Don't eat too much chocolate. And I'll be back the following week here with Let's Go Green on Midlands 103. Let's Go Green, sponsored by Airgrid, managing and operating Ireland's electricity grid for a cleaner energy future. Check out airgrid.ie for more.